Good evening, folks, and welcome to another Thursday night edition of Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Al Huey, along with my partner, Robert Ironman, and our special, special, <laughs> extra special guest tonight is former city councilman, former city mayor, former uh, hot dog <laughs> salesman, <laughs> Chip Holloway. Former Thanks owner for being long with pants. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Good to see you guys. In a non-hostile environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, here on Ridgecrest Talk, we're hard on the issues, but soft That's on the right. people. That's right. right. We'll make an exception for you. <laughs> 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 so the reason we uh, invited you to, to come on and talk to us is there was a recent town hall meeting, and I hope everybody heard about it. There was a pretty good fair turnout for that town hall yes. meeting. Town hall meeting on economic development. We had a lot of uh, movers and shakers there, business people and entrepreneurs in town and uh, a lot of private citizens who were just interested in the betterment of the city, uh, you being one of them. Uh, we had, uh, what is his name, Stu Witt? Stu Witt. Yes, uh, he was there. The individual that developed the Antelope Valley uh, Airport. Mojave where Spaceport. The Mojave Spaceport. Or Mojave Spaceport, Correct. where the plane flew around the world without uh, refueling. Uh, uh, very interesting what he had to say. But we wanted to talk about what you had to say that night uh, in particular. And then I guess there was a follow-up meeting from that, what, this last Monday? Monday night, yeah. Okay. So share with us what you uh, shared with the people at that meeting. You could. Well, I thought, based on efforts in the last 16 years, 20 years really, that I've been in Ridgecrest, um, that was a well-attended meeting mm -hmm. uh, compared to some of the meetings you guys have tried to be involved in meetings where we can't get any energy in the community. And um, I thought the meeting was well well attended, and it was a a different group of people. Um, the format was was pretty good, and it it didn't become a complaining session and you know except why, for why, when why. i got up and talked <laughs> <Right. laughs> you, you were the lightning rod actually <laughs> for jay imagine that but uh, but the um you know one of my frustrations was people in this town have uh institutional memory of of specific things and, and they grow many times have a life of their own mm -hmm. and, and the the one issue that i brought up that particular night was to a comment about the city doing proper due diligence or, and, and not uh, having so many failed attempts at economic development. Mm -hmm. It's not the first <laughs> meeting we've had on economic development <laughs> since I've been here. Right, and and <clears throat> the only reason I ever ran for city council was to do economic development. I had just moved to Ridgecrest in 1992, and, and I think we were still original hamburger stand when I got on the chamber and ultimately converted to Wiener Schnitzel. And I, you know, I came to Ridgecrest to grow and and, and uh, profit and prosper, and um, the town was kind of in the in the doldrums at that time, and I was on the chamber executive board, and the uh, uh, prison issue had come to to the forefront, and I wasn't really that involved in local politics at the time. But one thing I did f realize quickly is that many chamber board members were threatened by residents of this community that if they supported the prison without any investigation, they would be boycotted. And I found that offensive uh, because uh, when, when my first campaign slogan ever was to condemn opportunity without investigation is the height of stupidity, which is a quote. Yes. He comes up with these good ones all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just ought to call his cell phone sometimes. Yeah. It's a new <laughs> message every time. And, and that's kind of how I live my life. And I felt like on the prison issue, it never was really investigated. It was just, no, we don't want it. No thanks, get out, see you next, you know. And anyway, so my point of that meeting was in 16 years I've been on the council, I ran hoping to impact economic development. We had one major effort, if you discount the last effort that's ongoing that I was involved in the last year, the four investments we right. made from the TAP fund, and that was Matrix Motors. And Matrix Motors What about uh, Back Porch? Front Porch was before I was on the council. Oh, okay. Front Porch came about 1996, and it was probably wrapped up about now. I personally, outside of council, I was involved in Front Porch as an investor and lost about $25,000. Mm. But um, that never lost the city any money. The history of Front Porch was they got the building for $1 as a gift, 
and the city never invested a dime in front porch. So that shouldn't even be held up as a failed city right, right. economic development. Matrix, on the other hand, uh, was a failure. But frankly, I can tell you uh, now that both council members involved in this decision are no longer in town for different reasons, as Matrix could have been a success. At the very end of that project, when they tried, we tried to do basically avert the lawsuit uh, because of a council vote. We chose a path to pursue a lawsuit instead of a path that I think would have maintained at least Matrix the opportunity to be successful in Ridgecrest. And for the people who don't know, at the very end of Matrix, you know, Matrix came here. One of their failures was they were going to bring a windshield manufacturing business right. along with the race car business. Right. The windshield manufacturing business was the cash cow. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, that portion of the business didn't come with them. And they tried to to make it a make it a go with just the uh, race car, also to the city's uh, discredit, the economic development manager we had at that time had promised Matrix to build them an eight million dollar facility in the new business park before doing any due diligence on his on Matrix. And of course, the council had approved that, right? Right. When when he got here. They abandoned that because Matrix's financials couldn't support the debt service without the windshield part of the business. Ah, uh, okay. So the cash, so it wasn't really anybody's fault per se, mm -hmm. but there was reasons why the, the business plan fell apart. But my point of that was not to justify Matrix, it was the fact that that's really the only massive economic development effort we took on. We did small attempts at economic development. We never did a major attempt at economic development. And frankly, even that failure was not a general fund failure. That was from redevelopment funds, which had to be used for attempts like that, just like the TAB funds are now. Um, <coughs> if every one of those TAB fund projects go ar awry, yeah. it didn't cost the Ridgecrest taxpayers a dime. None of that money, that's found money that came through the redevelopment agency that would have went to another community somewhere in California if we didn't make those attempts. So it's it's always confusing. You guys are well versed in the city budget and financing, but most people don't realize about the little pots of money. But to me, the biggest failure, as I said that night, was we should be doing more in the, on the economic development front and making more attempts at economic But again, it's even harder now given how thin <coughs> city staff is. Oh, it's a combination of staff and the, and the fact that redevelopment funds are gone. You gotta go to break. That's the biggest problem. Gotta go to break. Uh, join us on the other side of the break with Chip Holloway. And welcome back to segment two of the Thursday evening edition of Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Robert Ironman along with my partner Al Huey. And tonight we're talking economic development with Mr. Chip Holloway. Did you have a question? Yeah, for I, I was brought up on the break real quick that uh, when a new business startup, they need to borrow money for to get the business up and going. They go to the bank. They have to have a business plan. And I was talking to a staffer at the city the other day uh, if the city required that. And he says, no, they can't. That's political. Um, maybe you can't deny them because of a shoddy business plan, but... I don't know if it's even legal. I guess the city attorney would have to answer that. Just have them submit a business plan kind of puts the pressure on them to, you know, maybe they were sitting at home and had one too many and came up with this <laughs> great idea, and then the next day while they were still hungover, ran down to the city to get this right. permit and never wrote anything down. I, don't, I You know, I, I understand where you're going with that, because with that, one of the frustrations is... Um, you know, from the chamber side, we, we get fr focused on the lack of customer, s the, the perception of a lack of customer service in town with certain businesses or certain businesses aren't engaged in con what's considered proper operating hours and things like that. And, and we have what I call a lot of hobbyists where, you know, a spouse yeah. has a pretty good job on base or well, something. Well, my else. example to the staffer was, uh, and this happened while Robert and I were still doing radio, was the batting cage business. Right. Now, that guy did a great thing for the city because before that new building was put in there, that was really a bad-looking look, piece of property. He cleaned that all out, 
uh, yeah. I had to cost him money to buy that. To your out. last question, though, he did, I think, have to present a business plan to the city because he did actually borrow some. He didn't borrow money per yeah, se, he did. but he got a waiver of some fees. Yeah. If uh, I had they waived some fees, yeah. And, um, and a lot of people thought that would be successful, but well, uh, I didn't. not <laughs> in that location. We tried to encourage him to put it right at the fields. You know where people typically go to play baseball, but uh, and, and add some other components to it. Right. But again, I think that was two people that you know the husband and wife both had full time jobs, and trying to run a business. And so many people think uh, a business is just a, a license to print money, and I can give them a bunch of examples how it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and, and, and then the other ones that we see all the time, open and close, and you've been involved in that are restaurants. Restaurants, yeah. Restaurants are the highest. Uh, business failure of any business, I think, in the yeah. country. Well, I, I don't know if you guys were at that one of the meetings when we were trying to analyze the four projects we went forward with on the TAB funding, which was EH, uh, EH Company, Protexa, Monarch. It became Monarch. It was Cal yeah. USA at the right. time. And then we did a little uh, consulting agreement with a company called Weedy that does... Um, Actually, I got some information on that, yeah. and I heard they're providing some good data. Yeah, they are giving us good data. My concern, not now I'm not on the council, so I'm not in the information loop, is where's the gatekeeper of that data? Who gets to say yay or nay? Or who gets to investigate it further? You know, who's, who decides? And that, that concerns me how much information is not getting past the, whoever that gatekeeper is on that information. But um, I think the uh, there's still huge, I think, one of the ideas that was brought up at that meeting that night, you know, is an old idea that seems to still be floundering around. Is is I always said, and me and Mick Gleason argue over who coined the phrase, but that our region should be known as the, I call it the uh, Silicon Valley of alternative energy. Some people call it the Saudi Arabia of alternative energy. I've added the term alternative energy and technologies because there's more than just mm -hmm. alternative mm -hmm. energy that we fit for. We we have a niche on biofuels that they're already working in on base. Solar's obviously a, a great opportunity, even geothermal. And wind's not an opportunity because of the radar problems. Although some people on the base have said, why don't we decide to develop stealth windmills, you know, with stealth technology, because that's what they do on base, you know? So, you know, there are creative people on the base. You're talking about those fans I see on uh, <laughs> TV where there's no blade. And yeah. Is that what it is? I don't know what it is. Because <laughs> so, the big problem with wind is it, it, it gives uh, echoes on the radar range. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, You yeah. should know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, big, uh, but we have a huge opportunity springs. in that. And, and uh, one of my uh, things that I've always pursued since back in 2008, because I read a front page article in Forbes magazine, and it's only getting more and more uh, notoriety is data storage and you know the cloud now is basically million square foot buildings full of computer servers well we need that high speed uh internet oh, yeah, and we've got digital 395 here which is the biggest problem most communities have is they don't have that backbone we have the backbone how do we get hooked on it that's i'm on another committee and that's a committee that that was already in place before this committee is that it was a broadband committee that came out of a little ad hoc committee that the mayor put together just to she called it, I think, the the 100 Days to Success Plan or whatever, and we were looking at some opportunities for the community. But broadband capability is going to be a, a not a nice to have. It's going to be an absolute requirement right. with the Internet of Things. You're not going to be able to do anything in your house without Internet capability. And we went two years ago, I was talking about a plan to give everybody in Ridgecrest uh, internet access through their property tax bill 100 percent penetration and we were talking about a six megabyte download wow. speed that's obsolete already now yeah. they're talking about you need to be at 100. i mean the average house has five uh internet enabled devices attached to their wi-fi system all your tvs are now digital mm -hmm. but but we've got that backbone that's a huge asset so we're trying to figure out a way to get people you know, who, who depending on that? where you at, the company that and people are confused because it was built with public money, but it's maintained with private money, and it's called Inyo Networks, and the Desert Valley's Credit Union has accessed it, and depending on how far away you are from the actual node, depends on the cost. I think it costs the credit union about twenty thousand dollars to tie into it. 
Now, it made sense for the credit union because they have so much secured data, financial data. That where's it, where's where does it run? I thought it ran down. It's about a thousand dollars a foot. Yeah, but I mean, where is the main? It runs line? right down China Lake Boulevard for the most part, and it runs to most anchor and, institutes. And isn't the credit union on China Lake Boulevard? Yeah, but it's still to run from where they had to run because they're not right on it. If you think of how far set back the building is from the street, I know that uh, Cal UAS. Now they did a connection, and there was already a node right there where DMV was. Yeah, but twenty thousand dollars, Chip. I know, I know. You can forget about residential. Well, getting. that's what we're trying to figure out. How can we help a, a uh, provide the infrastructure for somebody to then be able to resell it? Because the need's going to absolutely be there. All we've talked about. And we're having a debate with some. Is that what it costs to do with to get the broadband down there? Probably not, because that's the big that's the big frustration. Boron is what's considered a one gigabit city. Well, Boron got it all paid for by the taxpayers, because it's considered a disadvantaged community and underserved. Huh. But because we're not considered disadvantaged or underserved. Well, speaking of being underserved, we have to have. Yeah. Our uh, advertisers have some time here. <laughs> I hope so it's an internet on provider. The other side of the break. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to uh, Rich Crest Talk. <laughs> we're here with Chip Holloway. We're talking about economic development. We were talking about uh, 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 broadband. Uh, what is it? Something 395. I can't Digital 395. Digital 395. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, moment. you ask how do you get on there. We are developing a website because there are people that are very knowledgeable in this community about Wi-Fi access and broadband and, and business owners. That I was in a committee meeting that's an outshoot of the economic development group. And some of those folks didn't even know. But it, 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 it's got to be done, and, and it can be done economically. We, we need somebody. I remember you were here when Howard Ald brought the idea of bringing Internet to Ridgecrest. <laughs> <laughs> and, boy, he put his nose to the stone, and he got it done. Right. Well, you know, Cedric Knight created uh, Ridgenet, yeah. which have ultimately sold the Mediacom. And then you still have a, a local provider, IW Indian Wells Valley ISP. You can still get that and Mediacom and Verizon, or I guess. The All I'm saying one. is it can be done. And it it, comes it's down, not going to cost $20,000. Well, it. that's for the main trunks for these big corporations that, that yeah. need it. But somebody, it's called, you've heard, the last mile. That's the, the cost factor is the last mile. But Well, let's talk again going back to that uh, town hall meeting where we had all these people. And uh, what came out of that meeting, if you weren't there, was uh, they decided to develop a committee out of it of those who wanted to volunteer and help with economic development with the city. And uh, they came up with a list. I, I know you can see that. But <laughs> uh, there's a group of, uh, looks like maybe uh, a couple dozen people, something like that. Yeah, we, we and, had about 100 people at the And they broke that up meeting. into, huh? About 100 people at the first meeting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And now 20 at the follow-up meeting. So. Uh, they broke that meeting up, which was held this last Monday night, into seven committees. And then you told me there's committees under those committees. <laughs> there's, there's little. There's some issues within those committees that the chairman of each committee will have the opportunity to create, like, subcommittees on. Uh, and basically the way that came up about is I don't know if you saw the the list that Cedric Knight tried to con right, take the all pros those and things the cons, yeah. and he tried to compose those in different categories did a pretty good job. and some of them overlap and that's why they didn't fit in the nice least niches in each committee uh, at that you meeting I I if you said something and then somebody uh, opposed it then you'd have to pay five dollars to get right. up and oppose the person well I brought up at the well, meeting let me get my wallet out here because yeah. I want to <laughs> I brought up at the well, meeting, like I said, there are a lot of people there, but the number one employer wasn't there, which was the base. Uh, nobody representing the base was there. I guess somebody heard me. I was going to tell you. Because <laughs> we have a representative from the base now on, on that A committee. representative from the base showed up for that very reason, so your, your effort was warranted. Right. Uh, and Peggy and show. Mr. I won't mention her name, but there was an individual <laughs> at that meeting who said, "Oh, they can't come. They can't attend those meetings. They can't talk." Well, they about said it. they will be. They weren't invited. They can't go out unless they're invited. And the mayor purposely didn't reach out to individuals because she wanted to get people 
<coughs> who had some sort of initiative and truly were interested. And, uh, and so this individual from the base is going to take the committees back to the higher-ups at base. So who invited them to speak at the public lands yeah. issue? <laughs> yeah. Where'd they get I the invitation on that one? I agree with you 100%. Yeah. yeah That's right. the first thing no. I thought of. <laughs> Uh, no, that, that was a sour note with me, and I might talk about that some more down the road, maybe, possibly, uh, uh, you could bet on it. <laughs> but uh, so now it's up and running. We've got these committees going. Uh, Mayor gave us five weeks. To come back with <laughs> some data. I, well, no, okay, I, that's good, <laughs> that's because good. I was, I was going to say, you know, this typical bureaucratic right, BS yeah. approach, I was going to say, this is, your target is 2025, right? right no. <laughs> yeah. Five weeks. And uh, I think that's ambitious, but at least it'll get us to weed through stuff faster. Because you got a town of deep thinkers that can think for yeah. a long time. <laughs> a certain so issue, nobody so. wants to spend their life doing in economic a, development. A, you yeah. know? Let's get it done. That's what I'm saying. When I think the biggest failure, and, and I'm going to bring it up in this committee, and, and I don't know if you guys will agree with me, is I don't think we've done it. And, and this is a failure as, as a council member, former council member, I think that we've always had is that We've never done a good enough job of really illustrating the problem to the public if we don't continue to grow. And there's people in this community that I, would like to see us not grow. I can see the problem right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the right. Just go down to City Hall and you'll see all these empty offices. Right. They don't have the money. They don't have the budget. No, and, and I keep I don't know how they're doing the streets. If, if Measure the, L goes away, oh, they're in gone. deep trouble. If Even if Measure L stays, I did an analysis. I was the only person from the public that was at the, the budget meetings, and I was doing some math while I was in there watching the budget meetings, and based, you know, about 80% of our city budget's payroll, the general fund budget. And if you look at a 2.5% increase in those costs, we have to raise – Two and a half million dollars in the next ten years. If you look at the past ten years, I heard we're trending down, not up. I heard that the police department was like sixty-five percent of the budget. The budget, and that's not unusual for any city. And their overtime for this last year was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Overtime is always high in the PD, but it's actually lower than it was. A lot of overtime. Two reasons for a lot of overtime. If you get too short-staffed. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, right. You, you, cut, you cut the staff, right. but then you increase your overtime Or expense. a lot of times police officers, you know, five minutes before their shift, they get the call, and now they're naturally on overtime. So you can never avert overtime in PD. But that, that, that came up several to be times. That for overtime, I think I'd be, I'd Take a look at it over the last few years because I think it's, it may have been up last year, but it trended down for a while when we – We've never, ever, the entire time I was on council, we never got it to the full complement of sworn officers, even though they've been budgeted almost every single year. So real quick, we don't have a lot of time left. What do you think the possibilities of annexing out to 395 on I think that, Channel Lake? I'm sorry for that. That's okay. I think, um, You're a busy man. I think that the uh, there's a lot of cost involved with that yeah. that need to be explored. I think the concept's good. We explored that concept in my first term. But the um, the problem is there's no water, no power. Right, right. And and, and, and you're got five cents that. on every dollar. You know, the property tax is not going to support that. So the only way it would work is if you could if you could get the piece of land and sell it. it it'd have that piece of land would not that that concept would not support residential development. Is there any way to, to annex like a strip going out to? A uh, few acres out there alongside of 395. I, uh, yeah, as long as it's contiguous. But you got to be, you can't do what's called an island or a flag right. annexation can't do anymore, right. which they used to be able to do. Yes. But the, well, uh, that's what ought to be looked at. That's And that's kind of what she's trying to do. I thought she was trying to maintain the frontage along Town Lake Boulevard and then open up as okay. you get right on there. We'll have to do this again another time. We don't uh, have enough time, Rob. We always run out of time. But no, join us again time. next week. <laughs> uh, We'll talk about something else. Good night, folks.